Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and coming up in today's newscast, Israel fires back at the Gaza Strip after the Israeli Prime Minister is forced to take cover in a rocket attack. We'll reveal which Israeli startups made the most money in 2019 and get ready to smile because we have the rundown on the top five most exciting things that happened in the Holy Land this year. Israel has been experiencing some unusually strong weather. And to start the show off today, we have ILTV's Shanna Fold on the street with a little taste of what it's like. How's it out there, Shanna? Yes, Natasha, we've been dealing with some extreme weather out here. Last night, I can tell you, I was nearly knocked off of my feet from the wind, and the rain was extremely strong. I'm not the only one who struggled, though. Let's take a look at some of these shocking videos from Israelis who suffered all throughout the country. Now, the Israeli military has just carried out airstrikes in Gaza after rocket fire from the coastal enclave into Israel forced the Israeli prime minister to take cover with dozens of others. Let's look at the chaos that erupted last night as Prime Minister Netanyahu was campaigning for today's Likud leadership primary. The premier was rushed off stage to take cover for the second time in under four months after Palestinian terrorists launched a rocket toward the Israeli city of Ashkelon. The Iron Dome missile defense system managed to shoot down the incoming missile and no injuries have been reported. In most cases, Israeli leaders refrain from announcing their visits to the area surrounding the Gaza Strip. But this time around, Netanyahu clearly publicized his upcoming visit. <laughs> Now, Israeli warplanes have just struck several Hamas targets in the Gaza Strip in response to the rocket fire, including a so-called resistance site in northern Gaza. No Palestinian group is claiming responsibility for Wednesday's attack, but sporadic rocket launches and attempted breaches into Israel over the last week have disrupted the Egyptian-brokered ceasefire that ended two days of fighting back in November. After last night's rocket attack, the Israeli prime minister came back on stage after 15 minutes to tell the crowd, the person who fired the rocket last time is no longer with us, and the person who did it this time should start packing their things. The Israeli military holds Hamas responsible for any violence that emanates from the Gaza Strip. Well, the IDF chief of staff is now warning Israelis that the next war that Israel faces with Iran could be disastrous. And that's all because Israel is alone in the fight against the Islamic Republic. Aviv Kochavi is stressing that Israel is now ready and willing to go after every nation sponsoring anti-Israel terrorism. This is the first major speech that the IDF chief of staff has given since taking the helm, and he says that Israelis must mentally prepare themselves that heavy fire will be directed against the state of Israel once the IDF strikes Iranian positions more aggressively. 
and it's because of the fact that Israel will be forced to strike urban areas as a result of Iran's policy of using its own citizens as human shields. כשאנחנו אומרים שם, זה לא רק שהוא בחר להתמקם שם, אלא שמשם הוא יורה אלפי טילים ורקטות על אזרחי מדינת ישראל. משימתנו לעצור את זה. Well, the Likud leadership primary has begun, and the party's 116,000 members are on their way to vote. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu is expected to win against Knesset member Gideon Saar, but Saar's allies still say that gaining 30 percent of the vote will be considered a success. The Likud leadership primary has begun, and the party's 116,000 members are on their way to vote. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu is expected to win against Knesset member Gideon Sa'ar. But Sa'ar's allies still say that gaining 30 percent of the vote will be considered a success. Over 100 ballot stations are open across the country, and the results are expected to come out just a couple of hours after they close at 11 p.m. The winner of the vote will steer Likud into national elections, which are expected to take place on March 2nd. Netanyahu has led Likud since 1993 and has come to receive strong loyalty from his own party and political allies. Netanyahu won the primaries back in 2012 and 2014 by massive margins and even ran unopposed in 2016. But this time around, Netanyahu is facing a string of corruption scandals that could threaten his throne. His inability to form a government after the last two elections have left room for opponent Gideon Sa'ar to challenge his leadership. The 53-year-old former interior minister is promising to take a tougher stance against Hamas and Islamic Jihad and increase Israeli construction in Judea and Samaria or the West Bank. Well, joining us now in the studio is Michael Kleiner, former member of Knesset and president of the Likud Supreme Court. And to discuss the implications of the potential outcomes for the Likud leadership primary, we have you here. So tell us a little bit about this campaign and what this leadership primary means today for the Likud party. First of all, demonstrating that there is uh, still uh, one uh, democratic party left in Israel. And the fact that uh, 120,000 people have the right to choose who is the leader uh, uh, shows that Likud is not only running to the Knesset and speaks about democracy, but she implements a, a democracy within its uh, inner uh, process. Also, the members to the Knesset were elected in, in primaries. So people are free to uh, act according to their views, uh, uh, convictions, even if it's against the policy of the head of the party. While in uh, Blue and White, which is the other big party, there's uh, three groups that the leader appoints the members. So the members are dependent on the leader, and they don't have the liberty to uh, discuss him, to influence, to really influence him. Because right. if they oppose, he will make sure that they will be not elected next time. So let's talk a little bit about the tension that we're seeing here between Netanyahu and, and Saul. I mean, Netanyahu is expected to win. Um, but Saul's people are saying that, his allies are saying that if he gets 30 percent, that that's still a big success for them. Why are they saying that? Oh look! Uh, in in the past, it's not the first. Uh, it's not the first time that there are uh, primaries in the Likud. Netanyahu himself was uh, facing people tend to forget Moshe Arendt at the first time, mm -hmm. and he got seventy five percent vis a vis twenty five percent for Arendt. He was against Moshe Feiglin, which got also twenty five percent. Danny Danone, the same result. Sylvan Shalom, which was the most serious contender, who got almost uh, 40%. So there is a nucleus of 20, 25% that are always opposition. Okay. And so if, uh, I guess, Sar, if he gets 30 is the norm, this is what he is expected to get. And if he gets more, it is a success. If he gets less, it is less of a success. But one must take into consideration that people feel today very strongly for Netanyahu because right. they feel that he is attacked from the outside. Which just brings me to my next question. You're going to have to answer it very quickly because we're running out of time. But if Netanyahu does win again, which he's expected to, what does that mean for third elections? Because he wasn't able to form that co government coalition in the past two elections. It depends. I, I understand. I'm sure that Saar will help him. I believe it depends on the campaign and mainly on the ability of uh, Netanyahu to create the enthusiasm among, among Likud supporters, which he was unable to deliver, All especially right. in September. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.
All right, someone is getting rich in Israel, and we think we may know who. 2019 has been an outstanding year for Israel's tech industry. Startup exits, which are IPOs or M&As, they've surged by 102% compared to 2018, totaling $9.9 billion. Now, to put that into perspective, 2018 saw a total of $4.9 billion worth of exits here in Israel, so that truly is a massive jump over the past decade. There have been 587 exit deals in Israel for a total value of, are you guys ready for it, $70 billion in the last decade. So who won big time? Well, the exit of the decade was, of course, Intel's 2017 acquisition of the Israeli company Mobileye, which makes technology for autonomous cars. And 2019 was also the third best year in total deal value, with the average deal size coming in at around $124 million. And get this, in 2019, U.S. investors accounted for almost 60% of all the deals. Uh, so, you know, it looks like household names like Google, Samsung, and Amazon are truly having a lot of fun shopping in the Holy Land. All right, moving on now. Five million people suffer from lupus across the world, which is an autoimmune disease that affects 1.5 million Americans and around 5,000 Israelis. Now, while the disease can be treated, there is no permanent cure. And now Israeli and American researchers are teaming up. They say that they've got something in the bag. ILTV Shanna Fold has the scoop. Lupus is a long-term disease that makes your immune system attack normal, healthy tissue in your own body. The illness causes swelling and damage to your skin, joints, and organs, and mainly affects women of childbearing age. Until now, there hasn't been a cure. But Israeli researchers from Ben Gurion University in the Negev are working with the U.S. National Institute of Health to find a strand of hope, and they say they've made a breakthrough. Researchers have created a specific molecule that prevents mitochondrial DNA from being able to flow through the body and attack healthy tissues and organs. So far, the two groups working on the cure say they've shared remarkable success in treating their lupus patients and are beginning to start using the method to treat other diseases as well. Researchers say the molecule they developed could also be a benefit to Alzheimer's, Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis. Okay, a lot can happen around the dinner table. And today in the studio, we have a chef from London whose specialty is creating relationships based on food, especially here in Israel. Joining us now is Natalie Breyer, the founder of Nutella Eats. So you are known for creating relationships, whether they're romantic, business, you name it, over food. Tell us how you got into this. Okay, so I've been cooking since I'm two years old. My mom used to give me dough to play with to make biscuits. I, went, I trained as a chef when I was 16. I went to catering college for two years. Then I worked in tax for 20 years, about all the time networking and doing business development. So in the middle of this year, I decided to put all those skills together and create networking events around food for business, love and friendship. So give us an example of the types of events that you do. Okay, so I'm doing a series of demonstrations. Um, I've just, just the other week, I did a vegan one with a chef who came from China. I'm going to be doing one with an Italian chef, a Roman chef, who's been in Italy for 400 years, oh, wow. but now lives in Tel Aviv around the corner. Um, I'm going to be doing a party with um, Nissen Black's manager, um, oh, nice. who is Prince's cousins, and he sings just like Prince. Very cool. So in, during these events, you usually take a specific dish or a series of dishes and you make them, you, you, you teach them to the people who are involved. Do you have any success stories in terms of relationships that have been built around that? Because you, you do do matchmaking, right? I do, I do. I've been successful seven times. I've got seven couples married. Wow. Uh, so I created a concept called Friday Night Chic where we had Friday night dinners that were super swanky. Oh. And I really was careful with the crowd who came and I curated in such a way that people met and got married. No way, yeah. that is amazing. But also there have been business deals, right? Businesses that have been built out of connections. Yeah, the thing is you don't even know. You put people together and one thing leads to another and next thing you hear there was a deal and when you dig down you're like, well, where did you meet them? Well, I met them at your yeah. event. So. Well, I mean, absolutely. Listen, there's nothing like like sitting around a dinner table and, and talking about life. I do that every week with my family. Right. So why not do that with strangers who you could absolutely. potentially form relationships Indeed. with? Thank you so much for joining us, Natalie, and telling us about Thank what you, you do. All right. The old city of Jerusalem is home to some of the most holy sites on the planet. And last week, ILTV's Emmanuel Godot showed us around the ancient Muslim quarter. Today, we're following her as she explores the Jewish quarter. Take a look.
We're here right now in the Jewish Quarter, which has a very rich history and is home to tons of synagogues and yeshivas. Behind us, you can uh, find the big synagogue of the Jewish Quarter, the Chuva Synagogue. Jewish Quarter started to become alive again in the 13th century. And uh, till today, it's very vivid. Jewish people surrendered between the years 48, 67. It was deserted. During the 19 year period, the Jordanians had control of the city under the Israel Jordan Armistice Agreement of 49. Some of the houses were destroyed by Jordanians in 1967. We came back and rebuilt the houses. And also we rebuilt the synagogue that was destroyed also by Jordanian bombings. And several years ago, we finished to rebuild it and it looks exactly like it used to be in the 19th century. When we came back in 67, it was an option for us to clear the ruins and start to dig. And when we dug, we found the Roman cardo, the one layer underneath us. 2,000 years ago, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in the year 132 and built a Roman city, and we found it. And this is the market street that goes from Damascus Gate, from the Muslim Quarter, through the Jewish Quarter, all the way. And at the moment, we just walked from present time 2,000 years ago. So we're walking in the Roman street, and what we see here is only half of the white street that the Romans built in the middle of Jerusalem as a marketplace. And if you look at the back over there, you can see the way the Cardo used to look like in the year 132 and on. The most iconic symbol of the Jewish quarter is the Western Wall or the Kotel, which is right behind me, where you can see hundreds of people coming to pray every single day. Many people assume that the Western Wall is the holiest site for Jewish people, when in fact it's considered holy due to its connection to the Temple Mount. The rock, under the Dome of the Rock is the most important place, the place where the Ark of Covenant was standing in the Holy of Holies in the two temples that we hear. The first temple that was destroyed in the 6th century BC by Babylonians, and the second temple that was destroyed in the year 70 by Romans. Due to the Temple Mount's entry restrictions for anyone that's not Muslim, the wall is the holiest place where Jews are permitted to pray, though the holiest site lies right behind it. People want to write something, to right. wish for something, to ask for something. It's like an ancient email to God. <laughs> I love that. The Western Wall itself stretches almost half a kilometer, but today only part of the wall is visible. If you visit the Western Wall tunnels underground, however, you can reach the segments of the wall that are hidden from view and touch the original stone. So don't miss out, because next Thursday, I'm going to be showing you the third quarter that I got to explore. All right, so this doesn't happen too often. An Israeli comic has just won first place in the Manga Awards, which celebrate serial mangas or Japanese comics. This is a huge deal because the competition had 340 participants from 66 different countries around the world. And with us in the studio are two winners, Guy Lindman and Nimrod Friedman. I hope I got both of your na names right there. But I'm very excited about this book that you have in front of you. Tell us a little bit about this competition and how did you start doing manga? <laughs> Well, um, we started doing manga um, 10 years ago when um, basically uh, we served in the IDF together, me and Guy, we've been friends since middle school. And we just, you know, we've been always been great fans of comic books. And we decided, you know what, let's turn this passion into profession. Hopefully, yeah, later I mean, on. that's what everybody wants to do. And, yeah. and you know, I, I'm a huge fan of Totoro and a lot. I watched Japanese, oh, that's uh, great. Japanese films when I was growing up. So I'm really into this. So how did you guys end up? trying out for this competition. How did you get there? Actually, uh, this is a, a passion project for me. Um, during my uh, study in Shinkare uh, School uh, of uh, Art and Design, uh, I uh, approached Nimrod, which uh, we worked together for many years uh, uh, on different comics, and mm -hmm. I offered him uh, to work with me on this uh, book. And what is the book about? Um, well, it's basically about um, the afterlife. Uh, but, you know, heaven, hell, the way kind of Western people think about it, but with, with a small twist. Okay. Basically, the way into heaven is a lot like a very bureaucratic government building. Basically, imagine long lines, a lot of papers to fill, stuff like that, just to make sure you're the right fit for heaven. And this is a long process. So our hero, uh, Isaac, 
uh, Itzik in, in Hebrew, mm -hmm. he has been stuck in that office, basically, for basically 10... Basically waiting in line to go to, he go to heaven. Exactly. He's just been waiting and waiting, and he can't get in. He that can't... sounds like life, right? <laughs> that sounds like life. Ex so, so okay, so this book... You guys made an entire book. This yeah. is not just one comic. This is a book. And were you the only Israelis at this competition, or were there more? Yeah, in the, in uh, 2019, we are the only uh, kind that uh, represent Israel. And you won. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No big deal. No well, big deal. No big deal. Congratulations, guys. This is so awesome. Can I steal this? <laughs> of course. Yeah, we're not going to let you answer that. You guys are just going to see me doing this. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All right. 2019 is coming to an end, and ILTV's Nittany Manson is luckily here to give us something to get excited about. Take it away. Okay, buckle up, because we are about to count down the top five things from 2019 that have made us smile in Israel. Number one, this cool Israeli medical advancement may just save some of you from an early death. Tel Aviv-based Al Fatou has developed radiation technology that can actually eliminate cancerous tumors in 70% of cases. No big deal. They're still in clinical trials, but we're still impressed. Number two, Eurovision. Is coming to the future. For the first time since 1979, the Eurovision came to the Holy Land, and so did Madonna to perform, but let's not talk about her. The Eurovision itself is the most watched live TV event other than sports, of course, with 200 million viewers worldwide. And they must have liked the Israeli version because Israel's 2019 Eurovision show was voted the best of the decade. Number three, sports. Israeli national baseball team qualified for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, which is a big deal seeing as this is the first time that Israel will participate for baseball at the Olympic Games. 2019 also saw gold medals for Israeli athletes at world championships in judo, sailing, and even ice hockey. Number four, space. The final frontier. Well, it may not be so final after all. In 2019, the Israeli space nonprofit Space IL made it to the moon. Unfortunately, the Bereshit lander did crash and burn on impact, but we'll give it to them anyways because, come on, they made it to the moon. And don't worry, this crash landing didn't dampen any spirits. Bereshit 2 is already in the works, and there's even talk of Mars. And number five, alcohol. Or should I say ancient alcohol? Back in May, archaeologists at the Dead Sea Arava Science Center stumbled upon an Iron Age brewery, and in it, some still intact jugs. We're talking about 3,000-year-old beer people. Well, these scientists did what anyone else would do in this situation, teamed up with brewers to recreate the Iron Age beer and had a drink. Well, cheers to that, and cheers to a great 2019, 2020. Bring it on. Now I'm excited for 2020. All right, let's take a look at the weather forecast. The rain is pouring down today, and we're seeing a high of 63 degrees Fahrenheit or 17 Celsius here in Tel Aviv. And this weekend, the rain should continue, and the temperature should dip down to high of 61 Fahrenheit or 16 Celsius. So make sure to bundle up and keep yourself dry. All right, before we move on, it is time to light our fifth candle of fifth Hanukkah. Fifth candle, yeah. And we have none other than our very own producer, Hi. Nauri Lizarraga. Thank you for joining us. So do the honors. What's up? What is going on? How have you been celebrating Hanukkah? I've been celebrating, actually, I have also Christian friends, so I also celebrated Christmas what and did Hanukkah. You do? What did you do? We for? just met for friends, so we had some margaritas, so that was, that was fun. That's, that's a, that sounds like a plan. That you sounds got like it there? You need some help? Uh, <laughs> I can let it up, it's fine, don't worry. <laughs> All right, so margaritas. That is one way of celebrating Christmas. I'm, I don't know what I'm shaking. What? Oh my God. <laughs> You're shaking. I am shaking. For Guys. once, for once, like, you know. You see, now I'm you see what it feels like to be in the studio. He's always making fun of me, guys, <laughs> when I'm in front of the camera. Yeah, she All has right. to deal with me a lot. I but, do. You know. All right, Nadi, thank you for lighting the candles. You're Happy welcome. Hanukkah. Now, before we leave you, we want to show you one more example of how strong the winds really are here in Israel. All right, now conditions were so out of control that even an enormous ship was pulled to shore in northern, or I think this was southern Israel, right, Nashkelon. Crazy, absolutely crazy. I wonder what the people were thinking on, on that boat. All right, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.47 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube. I'm Natasha Kirchak. And happy Hanukkah.